All righty. Let's have a word of prayer together. <clears throat> Father, we are th- grateful to you <clears throat> that you have <clears throat> given into our life an indescribable gift as the Apostle Paul set out before us. A gift <clears throat> that is ever growing even as you have described in the scriptures it's like a mustard seed which is the smallest of all seeds yet when it's fully grown it occupies tremendous space in our lives and father it's potentially possible that there be fowls in the air that get us off track with this So we pray that our hearts will be attuned to you in an increasing way. We thank you for the season that we're in, both in the annual calendar as we come to the conclusion of the Easter season and for the season that we are in personally in our lives knowing that you've determined the exact days for us when we be born, when we dwell on the earth, and you determined by the counsel of your will the race that's set before us. We thank you for this season, and I pray today you open our hearts to what you have as you bring change and movement forward into our lives. And this I pray in Jesus' name, and God's folks said, <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> it happens. <clears throat> it does happen. Someone says to you, <clears throat> You look like a man on a mission. <clears throat> you look like a woman on a mission. You ever had that said? <clears throat> yeah. Had it said. And surely, let's see, are we going here, guys? Let me try this again. <clears throat> Should we try it? There we go. <clears throat> and surely, oh, we're done. There we go. Let me get my mind back to where I ought to be now. (laughs) With that being said to you, what does it look like that a man or a woman is on a mission? Scurrying. Scurrying. Determined. Determined. Good. Focused. I like these. I like these. Let me put up a couple here like... Maybe an optometrist does. You know, we have an optometrist in our family, and for all of us who have gone through that experience of the eye exam, which is better, number one or number two, one or two. Let me do that by putting a one and two up here. And uh, what I'll be asking you is, based on the appearance, is... This person on a mission, or is this one? One or two, okay? Here's one and two on a mission. (laughs) One, definitely one. Good. I just had somebody put their glasses on, so we're right on target here now. (laughs) Okay, here we go. On a mission, one or two? Two. 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 Definitely looks like two, and a man and a woman on a mission there. This is drawing. Okay, another photo. One or two? One. Pretty evident, isn't it? You can see by the looks on the face here. If we go back and take a look at a couple of these looks on the face, you kind of see that intensity, that determination, that focus that was talked about there. 
This one has uh, quite a focus there, and so do they. Evident when you're on a mission. So this morning, we're going to take a look at Jesus and a mission. As a matter of fact, this is said about him. Now, it came to pass when the time had come for him to be taken up, that he set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. That was a look, wasn't it? Definite look. A set, and you know, this isn't the only time in the scriptures this expression is used of a face being set, a determination, a focus, uh, moving along. So this morning... I'm going to be asking you to look with me at what Jesus had to say concerning mission. We're going to hear him talk about a man, about a woman on a mission. And we're going to gain from what he gives to us here. Well, we're going to gain what will help us move through change. You know, this is the second to the last assembly that we'll be having here as Heartland Sunday morning worship. Jesus is about to set out before us on his second to the last communication that he had with his disciples before he was taken up, (laughs) before he was taken up. And in this message, Jesus sets out the mission for moving through change. I'm going to ask you to be turning with me to Matthew chapter 28. It's his second to the last message. In our first message in this mini-series on moving through change, so walk in him, we took a look at the part of the so walk. This is the walk that we're to have moving through change. Having been rooted and built up in him, as we were taught, we're we're to be established and overflowing with thanksgiving. And we took a very, very important look at this walk that we have through change. And then we looked at the in him. The race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus in Hebrews. That was last week. Looking unto Jesus, the one who started this, the one who will bring it to its successful conclusion. Consider him so we don't get weary and lose it and lose this on the race before us. This morning... We're going to take a look here at Matthew chapter 28. So I'll ask you to turn there. And we're going to take a look at moving through change, keeping the same mission. If you're with me in Matthew chapter 28, since we are in the Easter season... And since we are moving through change during this Easter season, we're going to take a look at the events of Easter. Matthew chapter 28 is about the immediate resurrection day events. We come to verse 16, which will be the focus for us this morning, and reread this. But the disciples, the eleven disciples, went to Galilee, 
to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped. But some doubted. And Jesus came near them, saying unto them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. It's the statement of the mission. Verse 20, or chapter 27, he's delivered up, he's tried, he dies, he's buried. Matthew chapter 28, resurrection day events. But the disciples went to Galilee. And Jesus appears to them there. This mission, the aim of this message, as a matter of fact, the aim of what we are doing this Easter season in moving through this change is the mission that we're about to look at. It's to advance the mission, to be better, more effective, more efficient in the mission. That's what this is about. And the mission he gave us has these three things to us as you look through it. Number one, beginning with his point. That's where the mission begins. With the point. The point that he makes is a claim. It's a claim that he has demonstrated over and over and over and over and over and over and over. I don't think I said that enough. Over and over and over throughout his life. The mission has its source, its beginning in his point. That's a claim. Then number two, we carry on with this mission, his plan, and it's a charge, often called a commission. As a matter of fact, we know this passage as the great, what? (laughs) The great commission. That's how we know it. We carry on with this charge as he describes it, not as we Look to it. It's a mission. And we're holding on in what unfolds in our life, in what takes place with his promise. And his promise is a commitment. Now, as we uh, take a look at this mission, at the end of Matthew, I want to share with you something that I don't normally do. I'm going to give you kind of an extensive quote, but it hits a point. This quote reads like this. If a Christian understands all the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, but fails to understand this closing passage, he has missed the point of the entire book. This passage is the climax and the major focus point, not only of this gospel, the gospel of Matthew, but of the entire New Testament. It is not an exaggeration to say that in its broadest sense, it is the focus, or excuse me, the focal point of all Scripture, Old Testament as well as New. 
This central message of Scripture pertains to the central mission of the people of God. A mission that, tragically, many Christians do not understand or are unwilling to fulfill. It seems obvious that some Christians think little about their mission in this world except in regards to their own personal needs. They attend services and meeting when it's convenient, that they take what they feel like taking and have little concern for anything else. They are involved in the church only to the extent that it serves their desires. It escapes both their understanding and their concern that the Lord has given his church a supreme mission and that he calls every believer to be an instrument in fulfilling that mission. <clears throat> Looks like a man on a mission. <clears throat> Looks like a woman on a mission. Does it look like that when you're seen? <clears throat> a man on a mission. <clears throat> there is an appearance to that. One, <clears throat> on a mission. Two, <clears throat> not on a mission. Which is it? <clears throat> this morning, we're going to hear what stays the same. As we move through change, this stays the same. No, not exactly the same. It's actually going to be advanced. It's going to be taken forward. That was the reason for the decision that we're doing. It was based on this. The beginning point that Jesus makes is a claim. It's a claim that he states very, very succinctly, having demonstrated it to us. We need to pick up the point as being the source, the beginning of going with him on his mission. The background to this point, this claim, is, is twofold. Remember, this is resurrection day that we're looking on. That's the background of this thing. It is resurrection day, chapter 28. And I want you to look with me at this resurrection day event number one, which starts out in verse number one. There's a Mary and a Mary that's here. Now, after the Sabbath... Towards the dawn of the first day of the week. Now, this Sabbath was not a regular Sabbath. This was called a high Sabbath day because this was the Passover Sabbath. The Passover happened once a year when they would celebrate the passing over of the death angel where God destroyed the Egyptian firstborn to get his people out of Egypt. It was their annual commemoration of that, and it's a high Sabbath. It's a high Sabbath day. And on this day after, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, which we know is Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. Now the context is that Jesus has died, he's been buried, he's laid in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, the tomb of a rich man and fulfillment of prophecy, and he is there. In there, and they go to that tomb. And they, and they look, and verse 2, a great earthquake is there, and an angel had descended from heaven, and he was, rolled back the stone, and he sat down on the stone, and his appearance was lightning, and, and his clothes like, like 
driven snow and the fear of the guards, they trembled when they saw him. They speak to the women and the angel says, verse 7, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and behold, he's going before them to Galilee and there you will see him. And so the women are all excited and they take off. And, and this is the first event on Resurrection Day. There is this communication to Mary and Mary, these ladies who had followed Christ. It's the first communication about the resurrection. They're excited and they run off to do this with a great deal of joy. And verse 9, as they're going, all of a sudden, Jesus himself appears to them on this first event of the resurrection. And Jesus met them and said, verse 9, greetings. And they came up and took hold of him in his feet. And Jesus said, Jesus said, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, that I am going before them to Galilee, and I'll meet them there. And so twice over, he communicates this in the first events to the ladies. That's the background of what we're going to look at in a moment on the statement of this mission. Very interesting. Interesting background. Wouldn't you agree with that? I would say it. Second event on this resurrection day. Event number two, these dudes that are present here. There are some dudes that are on hand. Verse 11 starts talking to us about these dudes. And while they were going, while they're going off to tell this to the, to the disciples, some of the guards went into the city and told the chief priests what had taken place. What had happened? Now, we have to set a little bit of the background here because these guards had been placed by the chief priest and the Pharisees petitioning Pilate, who was the governor. Well, here, slide over to verse number 62 of chapter 27. Now, the next day, and they're being clear here, the next day after the day of preparation... What was the day of preparation? The day of preparation was the Friday that is the preparation. Well, <clears throat> let me back up. The day of preparation, Sabbath day, is on the Sabbath, which we know is the sixth day of the week. And the preparation day for the Sabbath, and this being a high Sabbath, had some big preparations to celebrate the Passover. The preparation day, on that day, it says the next day, that is after the day of preparation. Okay, so the preparation day was the Friday for the Saturday which is the Sabbath day, a high Sabbath day. So the next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. Do you see what's going on here? <clears throat> this is a Sabbath day. It is a high Sabbath day. And they just didn't go into Pilate when they delivered him up to them because ooh, I don't want to be defined. And now, on a high Sabbath day, they're in there with Pilate. They're before him. And these chief priests and these Pharisees, they appeal to him, verse 63. We remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he's risen from the dead. And Pilate hears that, verse 63 or verse 65, and he says, you have your guards, go and make it as secure as possible. Now, after that, they set the seal on this tomb and they posted a guard, a Roman guard, a Roman guard. And do you know the nature 
of the Roman guard fulfilling its responsibility? If they didn't do their job, they were executed. That's the, it happened. It happened concerning Peter and the Roman guards that let him get away and they were executed. That's the nature of this. So these chief priests and Pharisees on a high Sabbath day go and defile themselves to a pagan ruler to petition to have a guard. The guard is posted And this is what takes place, verse 11. While the women were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And they had assembled with the elders and they took counsel and they gave sufficient sums of money to the soldiers and said, tell the people, his disciples came by night and took him away while we were sleeping. They stole him while we were sleeping. Say that. And if this comes to the governor's ears because they'd be killed, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and they did as directed. And this story has been spread to the Jews, Matthew says, even to this day. You know, years later, Justin Martyr and Tertullian still have to talk about this. And and you know, this is is really a weird thing. Think of these Roman guards knowing that they'll be killed if they fail on their duty. And they say, we fell asleep. And the soldiers came and stole him. How did they, or it's not the soldiers, but the disciples came and stole him. How did they know that the disciples stole the body if they were asleep? <clears throat> and if they weren't asleep and they saw who stole the body, they're going to be killed for dereliction of duty by a Roman soldier. This is obviously, this is obviously trying to make do. Have you ever had that experience? Still happens in international affairs. Here's these providences in the Ukraine. And we've got to go attack the whole nation to protect these providences. Oh, you can see through that? Can you see through that? You can see through that. So, they went with their story, and it was still spread. But now we come to verse 16. But the disciples went to Galilee. Why did they go to Galilee? Because Jesus sent them to Galilee. As a matter of fact, as they were finishing the Last Supper on the night in which he was betrayed, he told them that he was going to be delivered up and he said, when I'm raised, go to Galilee. And he has it repeated to these guys through the women two times. Two times, getting the message across. Post-resurrection day events, the disciples go to Galilee. And when they come to Galilee, verse 17, they saw Jesus. They saw him as a distance, and immediately they fell down and gave honor and respect to him. But the Bible says some doubted. Some didn't really think it was him. Some of them thought, no, that's not him. The others are full. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's him. I don't think, I don't think it's him. Now, post-resurrection day, background over. Let's talk about the exclamation. 
the exclamation that Jesus makes to them is this, verse 18. And he came. And the Bible says that they were there and he came near to them. And he came to there to them saying something very important. As a matter of fact, saying this, he said it. That's the way the Bible presents this, that, that he emphasized to them. He emphasized this thing. All authority is given unto me. All authority in heaven and on earth is given unto me. Now, this is rather an extensive amount of authority. This is a rather all-inclusive amount of authority. You see the word all that he uses there? It's the word that means individually each, every, any particular authority. It's a word that means collectively the totality of it. Each and every individual authority in its totality has been given unto me. That's what Jesus says. And when he talks about authority, he talks about jurisdiction. He talks about the power of giving direction. He talks about the ability and the capability of managing all of this. And it's not like limited authority. It's all power in heaven. When he talks about heaven, he's referring to the realm of God's rule. It's the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. It has to do with all the principalities and the powers and the council and the dominion. As a matter of fact, when the apostle Paul attempts to present this, he says it like this. Above every principality and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. It's all of the power. It's all of the jurisdiction. It's all of the freedom to, and capability to use that authority in any way that you see fit, any way that you want. It's all of it in heaven, Jesus said has been given unto me. I have it. And, he says, not only in heaven, but all of it that is on the earth. And what he talks about here is all the people, all the nations, all the rulers, all of the... Power. Now, this, this power isn't only physical, material power, which Jesus demonstrated that he had. As a matter of fact, he did miracles, and the disciples said, the wind and the sea obey him. They were totally amazed when they saw that the devils were subject unto him, and even unto them, as he commanded them. This is the power that is not only material, physical power, physical power like this. The lame walk, the blind see, the dead are raised. It is power, all in heaven, all on earth, has been given unto me. And he's demonstrating this. He's demonstrating that he has that power, and here he is claiming it. It also has to do with power that is mental and immaterial. Why do you say in your heart this? The heart of the king, you know this, is in the hand of the Lord. And what does he do? He turns it wherever he wills. All material, physical power. No one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down. 
I have the power to take it up again. All power. All. Each and every, any, and the totality of it in collection, in heaven, on earth, has been given unto me. When Daniel sees this, he says, one like the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days and presented before and to, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and a power that all the peoples, all the nations, all the men of every nation and language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. All power over all nations and peoples and languages has been given unto me. This is a statement of an action that is past and it's done. This is a done deal. What does a person do with such power? Rulers do with power that doesn't match this in any way, shape, or form. They invade on a pretext that a, that a junior high kid could see through. Another country, out of evil aggression. Putin, he's an evil aggressor. Nero, with a power that didn't match his, burned Rome to the ground. Why? He couldn't watch TV at night. So he came up with his own drama and burned it to the ground. And he said, this is why, because I wanted to see it burn. <clears throat> and who'd he blame it on? <clears throat> the same thing that motivates Putin. That is a religious issue. <clears throat> As we demonstrated. Nebuchadnezzar, <clears throat> who had an interesting rendezvous with this kind of power. What does he do? He builds this, this thing to himself to bow down. What does Jesus do with all power in heaven and on earth? This is what he does. He gives a plan. This is a plan. I got all this power. And, and the power that I have isn't just so I boss you around. It's so that you have a part to accomplish. He does it like this. There's a background to this plan. The background is this. Therefore, he says, based on that, that I have all this power demonstrated and now clearly exclaimed to you in heaven and on earth, based on that power of all authority in heaven and on earth, go, therefore. And this is a very interesting thing because the statement that he makes here is having gone, therefore, having gone, because you are coming with me. That's what he's saying here. Therefore, you are coming with me. You see, the disciples, they didn't go and get involved in this 
passing around that the disciples stole this. No, they instead went, like Jesus said, to Galilee, though this was all going on post-resurrection in Jerusalem, and the place was a buzz. I'm telling you, if there's some scuttlebutt going on, this is higher yet. That place was a buzz with what was going on. And they went to Galilee because Jesus told them to, and that's what he uses. You've gone with me. You're with me. You're with me on this. And because that being the background, and you've gone with me, he then presents this, the explanation of his plan. Here's the plan. Here, here's, here's what we're going to do. Here's what you're going to carry on. This is what's going to happen here. Remember, this is his second to last message. His last message, when he's talking to them, all of a sudden, shh, he goes up from their sight, and they're sitting there staring at him travel up when he said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to be witnesses. You're going to tell what you see and what you know to me. You're going to be witnesses telling what you see and know of me. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and where else? Where else? Where else? To the other parts, to the ends of the earth, to, to the other parts. Were the disciples ever made it there? They never made it there. Some of them went to different spots. Thomas, they say, went to India. Seems to be that there was a tradition there. But to the ends of the earth, they never met it there. But the mission did. Because the mission was adopted. <clears throat> the explanation of this thing, <clears throat> this mission, because you've gone with me, because you're gone with me, because you're going with me, it's got three parts to it. <clears throat> Number one, disciple. He's been calling them right along his disciples. They are recognized as the ones who have learned from Jesus. A disciple, Jesus said, is not above his teacher. But, but when he has been fully trained, when he's learned this stuff as he's to learn it, then he'll be like his teacher. He'll be like him. Go make disciples, learners who are not only picking up ideas, not only concepts like it's prominent in a education. No, it's not that. It's learning the way of life. You pick up on the way of life of this person. Not only their thinking, but their way of life. Make disciples. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> what we're going to do at this moment is to have you notice with me a passage where the Apostle Paul picked up on this. Turn with me in your Bible. <clears throat> to the book of 1 Corinthians, not very far away. 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. When you get there, I would like you to read. It's a very short verse. But the Apostle Paul says, this. This is a verse we should all memorize. We should all have this one in heart. It reads like this. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. <clears throat> Do you see that? The commission... <clears throat> that Jesus gave <clears throat> the charge that is his plan <clears throat> is to since you've gone with me 
make learners and use this approach. Imitate me as I'm imitating Christ. <clears throat> now, I remember Howard Hendricks <clears throat> talking about this, <clears throat> and I'm going to mimic him for a moment. <clears throat> Howard Hendricks had committed his life to this thing. <clears throat> Make disciples. And when he was doing this, sharing the challenge, he used this, this story frequently. <clears throat> he said, when, when I talk to folks about making disciples, the response I give, and here it goes, but I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I've got imitate me, present yourself to be imitate. I'm not perfect. Anybody here perfect? <clears throat> Jesus didn't say you have to be perfect. He gave us his perfection. <clears throat> That's what he did. And as his disciple, you can own your imperfections. As a matter of fact, that's how you disciple. I'm not making it on this. I've got problems here. <laughs> you know, last week I shared with you a little bit about <sighs> this thing of discovering the meditations of my heart where the Bible... I, <sighs> driving along, all of a sudden, this verse, and the meditations of my heart be acceptable. And I thought, what have I been thinking on here? The meditations of my heart? <laughs> so, I confess that, and, and last Sunday, then, Nate, dear son of mine, <laughs> runs a video, shares it with his friends and other folks at church. Hey, this, this is like dad. We all agree, Nate, John, Josh, all the guys agree, this is like dad. And they showed me a video of a guy who is every new idea putting it down. <laughs> every, well, that, that'll never work. Ha! Ah, don't invest. Don't go with that. No, nah, I won't make it. And I, that's me? Is that me? We all agree that's dad. That's me? Where could, come on. Where is this coming from? And this past week, I've been asking the Lord, is that me? Is that me? And you know, one of my girls this week said something, and I immediately, Hi! <laughs> I'm doing it as a joke, man. I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. <laughs> That's me. That's me. That is me. I can't. That is me. <laughs> I can't disciple. I'm not perfect. No. That's all part of it, you see. Because this is the thing that grows us. This is the thing we're called to. This is it. This is it. Go make disciples to imitate you. And when they point out to you where you ain't imitating him, deny it, say it's not me, become protectionist, defensive. No, no, no. Repent and own it, amen? That's the idea. That's the idea here. Make disciples, baptizing them. This is not a formula for, for this Let's see. I got to inform this correctly. Some people say sacrament. No, it's an ordinance. For the ordinance of baptism. 
This is not a form. It is what we should use. The idea here of baptism, the word is transliterated rather than translated. Translated, the word is immerse. Immerse them. Immerse them in the name, the character, the identity of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, that this is your identity. What God is and does and accomplishes Accomplished, you have Christ who's redeemed you. You have the Spirit who's, who's empowering you, producing fruit in you. You have the power of the Father there, an identity where he is working everything after the counsel of his own will for the good in your life. He's doing that. Immerse them in the identity of this God who's there now, part and parcel of their life. Immerse them in it. Immerse them in it. And he says this, teaching them. Teaching them. Passing on to them everything I've directed. Everything. Everything. Everything that Jesus emphasized. You know, this thing is not about conversion only. I was saved. When I was a kid, I went forward. They baptized me. They gave me a Bible, wrote my name in it, and said, once saved, always saved, and I'm good. <clears throat> J.D. Greer talks about that in a book called Stop Asking Christ Into Your Heart. <clears throat> and what his point is, is this is a work of God, and he tells a story about a guy who he's playing basketball with, who was bragging about his drinking bouts and his riotous living, and he kind of wanted to, so he got around the guy, started talking to him about Jesus, and the guy said, hey, you trying to witness to me? And he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> he said, you don't need to witness to me. I know all about that. You see, as a kid, I went forward, and I got a Bible, and I got baptized, and they told me once saved, always saved. So <laughs> afterwards, I found some other things that were pretty good, but I'm good, so you can go on. <laughs> I want you to know that if the Christ is genuine, he changes your life. And his mission and carrying this out because it's his charge and he has all of this authority becomes very important to you. Amen? It becomes immersed in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the Father is working everything together for good in my life. After the counsel of his will, the Son has redeemed me and paid me all. I just trust him. And the Spirit is producing this fruit and causing you to grow and to change. And we're in on this. We're in on this. Teaching. This, by the way, is an ongoing direction. <clears throat> End of story is this. Hold on to the promise. Promise is this, the background. Jesus says, disciples hearing this, <clears throat> make disciples? Who can do that? I'm not perfect. <clears throat> I want you to look at this. Look at this. I, myself, I am with you in this. I am with you. I'm with you. Look at this. I'm with you. It's not you. It's never been about you. It's always been about what I'm doing with you immersed in the Father, the Son, Spirit, 
When you're born with me, you go with me. You join me in what I'm doing. The disciples did that. They went to Galilee. The rest of the world, they went to Galilee because they went with him. I'm with you. I am with you. When it seems pretty bleak, I'm with you. When it's, man, this thing just, I'm just not cut out for this. I am with you. I am who have all the power in heaven and in earth. And the extent of this promise, I am with you always, literally all the days, day after day after day, even unto the end of the age, until this is over, until, like John Walford says, there is a shout, he's here! of the archangel. There's a trump of God. And the voice of God. Come up and the dead in Christ rise until that day. And by the way, whether you're a post-trib or a pre-trib, whether you're an all-mill, a pre-mill, a post-mill, I don't know what mill, if you're even in that, this is going to happen. There's going to be a shout. There's going to be that archangel sound. There'll be a trumpet of God, and then there'll be the command of God. Come up here, and then it's done. Until then, we're post We're folks on a mission. You look like a person on a mission. You're going like you have a mission. Surely, you see you're in on this, right? You know, folks, if you've been a believer and you've accumulated a bit. I've had folks who been in church, went away from the church, wanted to come back to the church, came to the church, and said, you know, I was around the church, and I've been taught. I know. You know that confession? That confession puts you in a place that you're in on this. There's other people not as far along and you can come alongside and aid and guide and encourage and direct. Definitely parents with children. Definitely as opportunity arises grandparents with grandchildren. Definitely for other members of the church as you look for opportunities to encourage, to take forward. This change we're going through has this same mission. Connecting to God and others. Changing into Christ's likeness. Continuing this work of service. Father in heaven, we come before you because we've put our hand to the plow and we don't intend to look back. We want to look forward to what you're doing and opening up vistas of opportunity to come alongside to be of service, to aid and guide and encourage until it's over. The trump sounds, the archangel shouts, and God commands, come up here. Right now is our in this city. In Jesus' name, amen.
to me, <clears throat> that's a tearjerker. <clears throat> Greater things. All of you who have followed him have this to impart. A humble servant who can advance someone else in their walk. <laughs> and that is his mission. With all the power and authority in heaven and on earth that he has given to you and to me. Whew. Greater things. Let's talk about it. Let's go to the chapel and have some <clears throat> chili on a cold day and stimulate one another to love and good works. Amen? <clears throat> Amen? <clears throat> Amen. I'm glad somebody was with me. Whew, I mean, otherwise, I'm, I just went through a whole bunch. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> Any announcements here today that we need to make? All right, so the Williamson Wire this week, those prayer requests, I have some detailed. Are we still streaming? <clears throat> okay, there is encryption message that I will convey to you uh, for them. <clears throat> Number two, if you're interested, I have some information and opportunities. So <clears throat> that'll be available too. Father in heaven, <clears throat> Jesus is enough. More than enough. Thank you that you've not left us unaware, but made us so aware. In Christ's name and God's folks said, <clears throat> Amen. You're dismissed. Amen.